G'day Web Surfers, I'm Cowboy and welcome back to The Gaming Cabinet, a series where I analyse my favourite video games. Today is Eros birthday and so I wanted to celebrate by discussing a location which I think may be incredibly important to her and her allies in the upcoming game FF7 Rebirth. This location was introduced in the 2023 mobile game FF7 Ever Crisis. After completing a quiet struggle in the first soldier storyline, players unlock battle towers, aka the sealed tower of the Cetra. Here, players descend the building while fighting various monsters and bosses, sporadically collecting memories which are used to upgrade character stats and limit breaks. While the sealed tower has not been seen or referenced in previous FF7 stories, EC's role as another possibility for a remake means that at the very least, this place is canon to the wider universe of the franchise. This parallel reality concept explains the creative liberties taken in the game's events. They aren't necessarily canon to the remake continuity, but are canon to their own branch of the expanded universe. In saying that, I believe the tower will be relevant to the remake continuity as well. Glenn Lodbrook, a character introduced in the now-defunct Battle Royale game Final Fantasy VII The First Soldier, is widely theorised to be the cloaked man seen at Junon in one of the earlier Rebirth trailers. Special dialogue between Young Sephiroth and Glenn Matt Lucia. Ooh. Which I saw you guys speculating, who, who's that hooded figure in Rebirth? So if you want a little bit of backstory, highly recommend downloading Final Fantasy VII Ever Crisis. It's all connected somehow. This suggests that he and his EC backstory, including Rodori Archipelago, are not only canon, but perhaps even featured in Rebirth. As far as I'm aware, these islands and the sealed tower of the Cetra are the only two locations to debut in EC. Therefore, it seems unlikely that the latter is an inconsequential inclusion especially given the lore implications of being linked to Midgar and the Cetra by name, as well as to the livestream by proximity. Therefore, I'm confident that the tower will be canon in Rebirth, its current mysteries pertaining to its significance in the upcoming game story. These secrets can only be speculated on at the moment, but I want to share my thoughts on them all the same. As always, these are just my opinions based on the available evidence and may be subject to change pending the release of more context. I do not claim any of the following to be irrefutable fact or canon, and I welcome good faith discussions in the comments below. With all that being said, let's examine the finer details of the Cetra Tower. Firstly, where can we find this place? Text in the upper left corner of the Battle Tower's menu screen indicates that it resides within a chasm known as Midgar Falls. The modest size of its two cascades suggests that they may be relatively recent occurrences possibly a result of natural waterways and or Marco reactor runoff being redirected and funneled into nearby cave networks. Furthermore, the overgrowth and moss-covered rocks suggest the area has remained largely undisturbed for quite a long time. As the structure's name implies, the sealed tower of the Cetra is capped by a layer of rock and crystal which plugs the upper chamber of the chasm, allowing the building to be accessed from the surface via a platform and doorway at the very top. It is unclear how far the tower's peak protrudes the seal, but considering the thinness of the seal relative to the tower's width, plus the amount of sunlight shining in from above, I doubt it rises any further than just below the surface of the ground. Now, as far as specifics go, it is unclear whether the Midgar in Midgar Falls is used in reference to the Mega City itself or to the wider region surrounding it. For the sake of specificity, I will explore the possibilities of the first option. If Midgar Falls is within the CBD, places such as Deep Ground slash Sector Zero, the Marco Reactors, Support Pillars, and the Slum Settlements themselves should be disregarded, since the above and below ground renovation of these areas would likely have unearthed and possibly damaged the chasm years or decades earlier. Instead, we should look to the less urbanized areas of the Undercity for clues. Because of Midgar's unique design, with most of its infrastructure sitting hundreds of meters above the ground, this leaves a surprisingly large amount of untouched space for the devs to add new secrets. Considering the listed caveats, I believe Sector 4 or 5 is a strong candidate for its location. Of all the Undercity regions we've seen so far, Sector 5 is unusually verdant, largely thanks to the Gensborough Waterfall and the subsequent river which flows through the area. 
possibly originating from a water source in Sector 4. This water apparently carries sediments from an underground supply of the life stream, suggesting that the nearby ground is loose or hollow enough to let the life stream flow up to the surface more easily, similar to what is demonstrated at the Cetra Tower. This would also help contextualize why the now abandoned Sector 5 church was constructed where it was. It was literally built on hallowed ground, blessed by the life stream rich waters which could very well be tied to the Cetra Tower, a fellow sacred site from a different faith. Alternatively, Sector 6, barring War Market and its sewer system of course, is also a plausible setting. This region is sparsely populated, and mostly by criminals and partygoers who are likely too distracted by War Market to notice any allusions to the structure. Furthermore, the mountains of rubble and debris which litter the landscape could also be obscuring the entrance to Midgar Falls from would-be discoverers. The unstable ground caused by the partially submerged cave networks below could provide an answer to the cause of the Sector 6 plate collapse, and therefore why Shinra never put funding towards its restoration, leaving the sector in shambles for the last 31 years. It's also possible that it resides in a sector we haven't yet explored, but based on what we currently know, Sectors 4 to 6 remain decent guesses. Wherever Midgar Falls happens to reside, one of the biggest questions looming over this place is whether or not Shinra has discovered it. I wouldn't put it past Shinra to deliberately cover up the existence of a sacred Cetra site, since they've been censoring Cetra history, culture, and philosophy for decades. However, I also highly doubt that they wouldn't have tried to commodify Midgar Falls for its natural resources and possible insight concerning the Promised Land if they knew about it. Therefore, I deduce that Shinra simply never found the specific cavern containing the Cetra Tower itself. Next, we should explore the Cetra Tower's known history and purpose. As established by the Shinra presentation in Remake, the Cetra have a long, intimate history with the Midgar region, which contains an exceptionally bountiful supply of natural resources, especially Marco. This is evident in the fact that entire hills and outcrops were leveled in the process of the megacity's construction, a laborious feat that can only be justified by the prospect of long-term profit from a reliable energy source. Furthermore, despite the desertification of the surrounding landscape, Midgar has managed to extract Marco with nine reactors for decades. Considering that every other settlement in Gaia functions on only one, with inconsistent results at that, the Midgar region's exceptional prosperity is further demonstrated. While the Cetra seem to have been accomplished builders despite their largely nomadic lifestyle, as seen with the Temple and City of the Ancients, the sheer size of the tower, rivaling the peaks of our own tallest buildings, makes me doubt it was built on manual labor alone. Since the planet itself has proven capable of creating complex technologies such as the weapons, it's possible that the construction of the tower was a collaborative effort between the Cetra and the planet. In terms of the tower's role in Cetra society, I do not believe it was always intended to act as a seal. Such an architectural feat would take immeasurable amounts of time and effort to construct, even with the planet's assistance which is not conducive to the prompt banishment of a force warranting such a punishment. Instead, I think it may have originally served as either a counterpart or successor to the underground life stream waterfall shown in the presentation, a sacred space reserved for the most proficient communal and or spiritual leaders to archive their cultural wisdom and responsibly harness the life stream for the mutual benefit of the Cetra and the planet. Given their nomadic lifestyle, the sacred sites they presumably migrated between act as vital vaults of information preserving their culture, in lieu of oral history being lost due to them dying out and Shinra censorship. In an interview for EC, producer Shoichi Ichikawa stated that there is an alien being or being slumbering at the base of the tower. The very obvious hallmarks of Genova both in his statement and the area itself have major implications for the story of FF7. Was Genova just one of multiple entities involved in an alien invasion 2000 years ago? 
Or are the monsters within the Cedra Tower an offshoot of her influence spreading across the world via the livestream, necessitating the chasm's concealment? Is Sephiroth aware of this cesspool? And what would he do with this knowledge if he did? The possibilities are far too great to quantify for this video. But speaking of Sephiroth, my first impression of the purple sludge polluting the submerged base of the tower was that it was a sort of anti-livestream, similar to that which he commands in Advent Children. The anti-livestream is what created Jiro's stigma as well as the Sephiroth remnants. Not to mention the genetic material of Genova makes up most of the monsters encountered in the overworld, whether through mutating other living things or Shindra's experimentation. Therefore, I believe Sephiroth will discover this place and weaponize its corruption to further his nefarious agenda during Rebirth, whether he reenacts his plans from the OG continuity or formulates new ones based on his newfound foresight. While memories are not plot relevant items in EC, it wouldn't be surprising if the word association alludes to the sacred knowledge hidden within the Cetra Tower. Similar to other sacred Cetra sites we've seen in previous titles, it and the nearby livestream, both clean and corrupted, could give the party the power and insight needed to handle whatever challenges Sephiroth will throw at them. In Arab's case, exploring the tower may not only help consolidate her severed connection to her heritage, but may also offer the extra knowledge needed to harness the livestream while still alive. Her ancestors harnessed the livestream at will and likely used it to seal Genova in North Crater, indicating that Erev does not need to die in order to learn how to reconnect with the voices in the livestream and ask for their aid. In the OG timeline, she had succeeded in summoning Holy before being murdered, with it only being held back by Sephiroth's will and her ignorance as to how to counter that until it was too late for Holy alone to repel media. She ultimately appealed to all the souls in the livestream to come to Holy's aid, but as previously mentioned, this inadvertently led to the Geostigma epidemic and Aerith herself became relentlessly preoccupied with counteracting Sephiroth's influence within the livestream. Aerith preemptively summoning Holly and or the livestream while alive, allowing her to freely help the party somehow destroy or mitigate Sephiroth slash Genova's corruption, is the optimal outcome for the longevity of the planet and all its residents. If she's given more context about her ancestors' abilities and is able to overcome her resignation to her OG fate, Erev has the chance to reach her full potential and finally foil Sephiroth's schemes once and for all, before or maybe even without dying this time. It would be an unimaginably wonderful opportunity to breathe new life into her character, letting her experience the joys of freedom and leisure, away from Shinra's abuse and Midgar's desecration of nature. She could work with planetologists and Wutaians to proudly reclaim her heritage and reconstruct its culture, helping to abolish the oppressive, colonizing capitalist regime of Shinra. She could form long-term, meaningful relationships with old and new loved ones alike. Aerith's fun and inspiring personality has always been overshadowed by the tragic events of her life, especially her murder. Isn't it time to let her be more than her trauma? To give her a new legacy other than the sanitized martyr figure of FF7 that is commonly portrayed? Let Aerith have her solar punk anarchist era, you cowards! <laughs> But in all seriousness, the party and or Sephiroth slash Genova visiting this precarious trove of unsullied secrets could be a crucial factor in deciding the ultimate outcome of the remake project, including the fate of its most important character. One more idea I'd like to throw out there is its potential inspiration. As many fans know, FF7 draws inspiration from various cultures and spiritualities for its naming conventions of its characters, enemies, and locations. For example, Midgar is a thinly veiled namesake of Midgard, the realm of humans in Norse mythology. This realm is one of nine that are perched on the limbs of Yggdrasil, a giant sacred tree which functions as the center of the cosmos. 
I believe the Cetra Tower shares many symbolic and functional traits with Yggdrasil, further alluding to its potential role in Rebirth's story. The first parallel I noticed was the corresponding placements of Midgar and Midgard over the Cetra Tower and Yggdrasil, respectively. As well as providing the physical foundation of all the realms, Yggdrasil is also host to three wells at its roots. Invaluable sources of creation, wisdom, and destiny which even the gods themselves deeply cherish and covet. Likewise, the life stream, in all its sacred water symbolism, is the culmination of all life and the knowledge that comes from it, past, present, and future, and is also central to the motivations of people, animals, and aliens alike. Overall, the life stream represents the harmonious natural order under which all life is united, with the Cetra Tower acting as a conduit between the life stream and the sentient beings it sustains. Very much like Yggdrasil's trunk and branches allow life forms to navigate between worlds and acquire the tree's sacred gifts. This is further accentuated by the Cetra Tower's appearance. Of course, it is not a literal tree, let alone one supporting the entire universe on itself, but its organic shape and design does give it a passing resemblance to one. While Yggdrasil is often identified as an ash tree, the Cetra Tower adopts more tropical aesthetics, probably due to the Midgar region's close proximity to the equator of the planet. Curved beams wrap around the structure in a fashion very reminiscent of strangler figs and other types of vines and climbing plants. The greenery sprouting between the beams resemble the moss and epithetic plants which commonly adorn the trees in tropical areas. And lastly, the green crystal seal crowning its peak brings to mind the lush foliage of the canopy and or emergent layers of the rainforest. The perfect visual metaphor for Gaia's negotiation of nature and technology in its own right, but also comparable to the universally recognized tree of life in the process. Furthermore, the deepest reaches of Yggdrasil harbor the dragon serpent Nithogger, as well as countless other serpentine creatures which slowly but surely eat at its roots, causing them to rot and decay. It is said that Nithogger finally chewing through the root imprisoning him and escaping up to Midgard will be one of the many harbingers of Ragnarok, the prophesied end of the world as we know it. This closely parallels the situation at the Cetra Tower, with Genova or a Genova-like entity and its minions causing an extreme erosion and loss of structural integrity to the base of the building itself, as well as the pollution of the life stream. If they devour too much of the planet's energy, everything will die, reducing Gaia to just another mass of rock in the never-ending celestial abyss. With the Cetra Tower specifically, the corruption and monsters within could cause unspeakable chaos and destruction if the seal were to be broken by the tower collapsing. The fact that Severoth and Genova's race corrupt living things via genetic mutation and geostigma before exploiting these victims to try and destroy the world also mirrors Nithogger feeding on tainted souls and the insinuation that he will carry them into battle against the gods with him during Ragnarok. Regardless of whether the devs actually meant for the Cetra Tower to invoke Yggdrasil, the thematic parallels are fun to examine. Lastly, I wanted to note that while Judaism is also frequently referenced in the themes, settings, and characters of FS7, especially via the Cetra, I was unable to find any teachings or stories that could apply to the traits or themes of the Cetra Tower specifically. If any Jewish fans have further insight on this subject, please let me know in the comments below. Much like Yggdrasil, I believe the Cetra Tower will be instrumental in whatever Ragnarok adjacent scheme Sephiroth is hatching this time, as well as the preventative actions Cloud, Aerith and their allies can take against him. Or maybe I'm wrong and it was always meant to be an EC game mechanic with no further relevance, but I'm hoping they've capitalized on its potential to further develop the world building and characterization that makes the FF7 story so endearing to fans across the world. Thank you all so much for watching, and I hope you're all enjoying Eris' birthday as well as the countdown to Rebirth. Rest assured, I have much more FF7 content in store for you all this year. But in the meantime, stay safe, and I'll catch you all later. Bye!